This and all talks at the 2019 JavaScript for WordPress conference are brought to you in part by our sponsors Pantheon, a high-performance hosting platform with agile developer tools. Check them out at pantheon.io. Hello, everyone. If you can hear me, we are still at the JavaScript for WordPress conference 2019. So this is the last section of the day. I'm excited to be at this last section because I really want to learn how to build my first Gutenberg block. We had a talk earlier about Gutenberg blocks. Okay, so I'm going to be introducing Mel. Uh, Mel, Mel is a product designer based in Boston. Uh, not only is she a WordPress core committer and a former release lead, she's a regular core contributor and speaks frequently at what times on design, top typography, user, and user experience. When Mel isn't designing products at Automatic, she enjoys cold brew coffee, craft beer, and rocking out in her band. Awesome. So Mel, over to you. Uh, she's going to be talking to us, uh, talking to us on designing our first kitchen bag block. Hello, last talk of the day. Uh, my name is Mel Choice. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about designing your first Gutenberg block. Uh, I'm a product designer at Automatic, and I work full time on WordPress core. So I co-led the 4.9 release cycle, and I'm currently working on the Gutenberg block directory. Uh, so you can check out updates on make.wordpress.org slash design. So for most of its existence, uh, WordPress is operated on a document model of writing. You have an empty container that you fill with text from top to bottom. So there's a doc formatting bar, uh, usually at the top. Uh, and it usually looks something like this. So it's an interface that's familiar to anyone who's ever worked in Microsoft Word or in Google Docs. So the web has be, uh, evolved beyond displaying just digital documents, uh, but WordPress has only really just started to catch up in the past year or two. So the introduction of Gutenberg blocks takes us kind of beyond that document model of web authorship towards an approach that looks uh, less like writing from top to bottom and more like building something. So Gutenberg blocks are a little bit like Legos. Each is its own self-contained unit that can be combined to make some pretty fantastic outcomes. So like Legos, the possibilities are only constrained by your imagination. And you don't need to be a designer to make some pretty rad Gutenberg blocks. Uh, you just need to be able to think a little bit like one. So with some critical thinking and some familiarity with uh, core Gutenberg components and patterns, anyone can make a great block. At its simplest, a block can be a paragraph. So the paragraph block is a prompt that encourages you to write. You can add, uh, you can add inline formatting, like bold or italic text, add links, and change the alignment. If you want to turn your paragraph into like a heading block instead, you can do that too. So it's very similar to how WordPress has always operated. The paragraph is made pretty, pretty simple. So another block is the list. It's uh, in a document-driven editing model. So you would start by applying list formatting via the toolbar. If you click on a list button, it would pop up with a, uh, like a bullet point, and then you would start typing. Uh, or you could select text uh, and then click on the list, and it would turn it into one. And so the list block in Gutenberg is, is very similar. So you can transform any paragraph, paragraph block into a list, uh, or you could add a new list block directly onto the page. But some blocks require more than just a simple text prompt. More complex blocks require more advanced setup states. Uh, for example, the image block creates a placeholder with buttons for uploading, uh, selecting images from your media library, and for inserting an image from a URL. Uh, similarly, the quote block has two text inputs, the quote uh, and in larger text, and the citation in smaller text. So what it's doing is it's prompting you to fill out these, uh, these like, pre I guess, placeholder text. So you don't need to worry about um, like thinking everything up on your own. Some blocks are much more complex than that. Uh, they need more a more comprehensive set of state. So looking at the table block, uh, it requires you to select the number of columns and the number of rows before it can actually render the correct placeholder. And then you have something like a map block, uh, which most, most map blocks are probably going to require an API key. So you'd have to go somewhere external in this case, uh, there's a link to pop out uh, to the Mapbox site and to get an IP key generated 
it, and then you have to paste it, it's actually rendered a map. Uh, and so anything using kind of an external service like that is, is likely going to need a more complex setup state. Some blocks uh, might be drawing dynamic content directly from different parts of your site, like a post or a custom post type. So the latest post blocks, by default, displays the title of your most recent five posts from newest to oldest, and it doesn't have any sort of initial setup. You, you add it, and this is what it shows by default. Um, but then there's additional settings to configure it if you'd like. So if you are drawing uh, from existing content, you might not even need a placeholder at all. So Gutenberg blocks are comprised of a few different elements. The icon, the content area, the toolbar, and the sidebar. So each block has an icon used to identify it across the different block interfaces. So like the block library, where you like, click the plus sign that comes up, that's the block library. The toolbar, the sidebar, uh, and occasionally you'll see it also in the setup state. Icons are generally displayed around 24 by 24 pixels, but should be scalable. So I recommend using SVGs rather than something like a PNG, uh, or even an icon font if you can. So you can pick from an existing dash icon in the dash icon icon font. You could design your own custom icon if you are a designer or you um, have a designer on your team. Uh, or you can use an icon library from any sort of uh, like third-party GPL compatible library. So many of the new icons in Gutenberg are actually based on material design outlined icon sets. So that's also a good source uh, if you want your block uh, to actually like, look like it blends in with the rest of the cabinet. So when selecting your uh, or designing your block icon, you want to think about your block's primary purpose. Some blocks are obvious. Uh, it's like an image block should use an image icon. A list block should use a list icon. Quote should use a quotation mark icon, et cetera. But some blocks actually aren't so obvious at all. So what icons should a featured content block use? How uh, about a carousel Sorry. block, you know, CPA, pricing Sorry. table? There's all these different examples uh, where you might have to get a little bit more creative. So what I like to do is I look through icon libraries, uh, see if they have anything that kind of like feels like fits, or I'll search for my block name and something like Icon Finder, uh, which is just like a, a place to like find icon resources, and just see what kind of imagery it brings up. So see if a website building service like Squarespace's uh, Weebly also has a complimentary block, um, and you know, see what icon it's using. So like go and just draw inspiration from other sources if you're stuck. So when all else fails, uh, go for the most generic representation you can find, maybe a shape, something not a script. Um, and, you know, your block is always going to have um, a name alongside it in most cases, so you don't necessarily have to worry too much about um, being, like, the most exact iconography. So now that we've covered icons, let's talk a little bit about what should appear in the content area of the block. In an ideal world, uh, the only thing you'd ever have to think about when adding content to a block is your content itself. So what does this mean in practice? If a block needs specific information to render, uh, like an API, ask for that information in the setup state. So if you need posts from like a specific taxonomy, like maybe you only want to show posts from a travel category, you want to show a list of existing taxonomies on your site within your setup. And the most important settings for your block to operate should be in line with your block. Uh, so take, for example, the Jetpack contact block. The required setting, uh, which exists per field, but in each field is its own block, is displayed actually alongside the input label. So when you select the input block, you see a toggle to turn off required. Um, and when the input is actually not selected, you just see a live preview. You don't actually have that toggle. You only see it when you're clicking into that particular block. So your live preview state, when you have it put into a block, uh, should always mimic the front end uh, as closely as possible. So what did it actually look like when it's output on the site? You also want to choose really smart defaults. So it's fine to make like a super configurable block with like tons of options, uh, but you don't want to make your users or your customers think too hard about setting up if they just want something simple. So just do some initial research. Uh, what are that interviews? customers or finding uh, existing like comparable research from a reputable source like Nielsen Norman Group and just try to determine which settings most your customers change. So make these changes the default options and just like 
if if nobody wants to touch anything, then that's great. Like they should be able to do that. So uh, if you can provide your defaults, do it no matter what. Yeah, so let's just move forward to this section, the anatomy of a block. So Gutenberg blocks are comprised of a few different elements. The icon, the content area, the toolbar, and the sidebar. Each block has an icon to identify it across various block interfaces, such as the block library, um, the toolbar, the sidebar, you know, all the things we just mentioned, uh, and occasionally a setup state. Icons are generally displayed at 24 by 24 pixels and should be scalable. So uh, I suggest using SVGs um, rather than something like a PNG. You can pick from an existing dash icon, which is the icon font that comes with WordPress. You could design your own custom icon if you have a designer on your team or you know you want to give it a try. Uh, or you can use an icon from a third party GPL compatible library. Um, so like Font Awesome is a really popular one. Many of the new icons in Gutenberg are based on Material Design's outlined icon. Uh, so that's a good source if you want your block to look like it belongs. So when selecting or designing a block icon, you know, think about your block's primary purpose. Some blocks are obvious, so like an image block should use an image icon. List block should use a list icon. Uh, quote block should use quotation mark icon. You know, pretty straightforward. Some blocks aren't nearly as obvious. So like what icon should a featured content block use or a carousel, you know, CTA, pricing table, or like a testimonial, you know, you might need to go get creative and uh, look through some icon libraries, see if there's anything that exists that kind of fits your block's purpose. Uh, or you, um, so I was just showing some stuff. <laughs> like these are the contexts in which an icon is gonna show. Um, this is just an example of Icon Finder where you can like go and search for different icons, uh, see um, just what's out there so you can get inspiration. Okay, so now that we've covered icons, let's talk about what should actually appear inside the content area of the block. So that's like inside the editor itself. So from the Gutenberg block documentation, the primary interface for a block is the content area. So in an ideal world, the only thing you'd ever have to think about when adding content to a block is your content itself. Um, so what does that mean in practice? You know, if a block needs something super specific to render, ask for that information in the setup state. Uh, so like an API key, post from a specific taxonomy, you know, you wanna show uh, a list of existing taxonomies in your setup state. And the most important setting should display in line with your block. Take, for example, the Jetpack contact form block. Uh, the, the required setting, so like you have to enter your email when somebody you know is filling out this form, um, exists per field. So you can you could turn it on for something like name, uh, but turn it off for something like website. Um, and it should be displayed uh, when you have that particular child block selected. So you'll you know when you click into it, you'll see the toggle to turn on or off required. Uh, but when the input is not selected, so like look up to name, um, you'll see a live preview of the input. So rather than the toggle, you just see the red required text. So your live preview state when your block isn't selected should always just mimic the front end as closely as possible. And you really wanna choose smart defaults. So it's okay to make like a super configurable block with lots of settings, but you don't want your users or customers to have to think too hard about setting it up if they just want something simple. So just do some initial research, you know, whether that's a couple interviews uh, with existing customers if you have them, uh, or you can look and see if anyone's written about this topic before. Um, Nielsen Norman Group has a lot of really good research uh, and just kind of try to determine which settings most of your customers change and make these changes the default options. So like if everybody wants to show your block as a grid rather than a list, make grid the default and then add list as a secondary option. Let's talk a little bit about the block toolbar. So block toolbar is a secondary place for required options and controls. So it's a good place to put things like, um, you know, alignment, uh, text formatting options, uh, also a good place to put inline settings. So like, for example, if you saw Matt's uh, summer update at WordCamp Europe, uh, he had that footnote block uh, and that added an icon into the toolbar to use to like actually add the footnote. So by default, the toolbar um, always displays above the block. 
But you can also show the toolbar at the top of the editor if you have the top toolbar setting enabled. So you got to think about both contexts. You know, regardless of your block settings, uh, all toolbars are going to show the um, the more menu that has options for like uh, duplicate, move, delete a block. Um, but really, everything else is optional. Um, and you're also going to have that um, the block icon. So the toolbar is a great place to include inline formatting. So like bold, italic, strike through links. Uh, if your block has any text, um, if your block is visual, it's a great place to include uh, block level alignment and layout settings. Um, so in the media and text block, for example, there's a toolbar setting to display the media on the left or on the right. So like toggling that just like toggles where the text and where the, the media is. Um, you could also see in this one that there's um, a wide width and a full width um, like layout option. So that just controls the width of the block across your screen. Uh, and that is another thing that you'll, you'll just want to keep it in the toolbar. The Coblox plugin offers this custom font menu uh, on all text blocks. Uh, and so it's like kind of the perfect use case for adding a feature to the toolbar because it controls everything uh, in line. So it's like, like almost like an art direction block in some ways. Um, so it, it only impacts that one block that you're working on. Um, and you could see it like directly when you edit it. So it's just, it makes it a lot easier to like actually like kind of like do some WYSIWYG editing. So that kind of stuff is just great in the toolbar. So the toolbar also houses uh, potentially two different options, styles and block transforms, if they're relevant. So block styles are alternate variations on a block, uh, which only rely on CSS. Uh, take, for example, the button block, which comes with three default, which is the rounded corners, uh, outlines like a ghost button or squared. When these styles are available, they're accessible via a dropdown next to your block icon. So just choose a, a smart default, um, but feel free to actually like have fun with different styles for your custom blocks. You can even extend core blocks in like really interesting and unique ways just using block styles. So if you're thinking about recreating a core block um, like button or spacer or um, separator, just to add like new visual options, just rather than do that and make something from scratch, think about adding additional styles to the core blocks. Also that way, like it's easier to find because you don't have to search through like a bunch of different sections. And uh, you could also transform similar blocks. So like, you know, I mentioned earlier, a paragraph can transform into a heading, uh, quote, list, preformatted, or reverse block. An image can transform into a gallery, media, or text, cover, or file block. So these are all like related blocks. So if, you're, if your custom block is similar to another core block, um, you know, add a transform option. So uh, you could look at the Jetpack Gallery or the Block Gallery plugin uh, for good examples of transforms. Um, because they, they offer like additional gallery types and then you can transform it back into like a core block if you need to. So just make sure that if you do include a transform, the existing content um, converts smoothly to new block type, just so you, you don't want your users or customers losing any data. So just like try not to, you know, get rid of anything they entered. We do have good undo, which is true, but um, it just makes it easier to not have to like go back and forth and try to fix anything. So one caveat with adding stuff to the toolbar is that uh, it's entirely icon based. So um, only add settings that you can like reasonably represent using an icon or an icon group. Um, so now some blocks like group um, like alignment, for example, into its own group. Um, so there will be tooltips on desktop, um, but you know, any touch based device, you might not necessarily see uh, that labeling. So you can't necessarily rely on that. So lastly, sidebar. Uh, sidebar should only be used for advanced tertiary controls. So in an ideal bar, uh, ideal world, like you wouldn't have to open the sidebar at all. Um, the sidebar, as you might guess, appears on the side of your editor. You can toggle it on or off, uh, which means you can never really rely on the sidebar being open. For example, like somebody, uh, if you have a client who's new to Gutenberg and they uh, toggle the, the sidebar off, they might never explore and toggle it back on. Um, so if you have any like mandatory settings in your sidebar that you like need for your block to work, they're not going to find those and they're going to get totally stuck. Um, and also like the sidebar is hidden by default on smaller screens. You have to like toggle it on to see it uh, since there's not enough room for it. So, you know, it's a good place for like advanced and non-essential settings, uh, especially like like style customization settings, but a bad place for anything that's required or like anything really important. 
And settings within sidebars uh, should be grouped based on similarity. So for example, the paragraph block groups together text settings like um, font size and like the drop, ca drop cap toggle into its own section. Uh, the cover block positions settings like um, fixed background and focal point into one section. Uh, and then it has all the overlay settings. So like the color and opacity into another section. Uh, and so I actually think you should make liberal use of uh, grouping into different sidebar sections um, because otherwise it can get really overwhelming to see like, for example, like a huge list of toggles. If you could break those up into different sections based on like how you know, like they're related or like different categories, um, it just makes it easier to, to kind of browse and figure out what's going on. And so you might be tempted to add a ton of settings to your block you know, since they all fit in the sidebar, it's like an infinite, you know, tall thing you can scroll. But I'd urge you to think really carefully about what settings you add. Uh, just because like, once you include a setting, you're probably gonna have to support that setting like indefinitely. Uh, you know, with WordPress, it's really easy to add things and really, really hard to take things away, especially like any sort of product design <coughs> development. It's, it's just like deprecating is always kind of a problem. So if you include some settings in your block on a whim uh, and then suddenly get a bunch of like support questions for that setting, you might start regret adding it in the first place. Um, so if you if you do end up adding more settings uh, and you kind of like end up regretting it later, you know, maybe think about redesigning your block a little bit so that the setting at least makes a little bit more sense. So, you know, the more settings you have, the more potential problems. Uh, you have via support that you you know your customers your clients will run into just because like the more settings obviously the more complicated it becomes the more combinations so you want to think about your audience you know who do you expect to be using your blocks so if you're aiming for like site builders or freelancers um, they're probably going to want a lot of customization options so it's it's more appropriate to add a ton of settings for them um, but if your blocks are really just like aimed at casual users or hobbyists, uh, you should probably pare down your settings, just kind of the minimum that you need for your block to be useful. Uh, speaking of advanced settings, every block comes with an advanced section uh, that houses an additional CSS class option. So you can you know, add in a class name and that class will be applied to your block. Um, if you look at the heading block, that has um, like a, an ID that you can add so you can create an anchor link. So stuff like that belongs uh, in this advanced. Uh, and also like this, uh, this example has like remove top spacing, remove bottom spacing, which is like a really great additional like customization option, but not necessarily something that everyone's gonna understand or everyone's gonna need to, to, to have. So just like housing those in your uh, advanced setting is, is a great way to like have those options, but like not distract from the, the primary purpose of your block. So now that all of, we know all these elements uh, that make up a block, let's kind of put it all together. So a while back, I uh, designed a restaurant menu block. I've been wanting a better way to make restaurant menus in WordPress since uh, working on the uh, WordPress.com's restaurant menu custom post type a couple years ago. Um, the custom post type method of creating a restaurant menu just felt really, really clunky and tedious. You know you're in different screens, it's not relevant to like what you're working on. It's just like super abstracted. So blocks kind of provide a perfect opportunity to redesign the process of creating a restaurant menu. So Gutenberg blocks put the interface actually within the context that you're gonna be displaying and previewing the menu in rather than in like a different WP admin screen. So it also, you know, you could add text placeholders that make it easy to fill in the blanks uh, to add content rather than like, you know, just filling out a bunch of uh, a bunch of forms from like nothing, so it just it felt like much more of a natural uh, natural fit than custom post types did. So going into this project, uh, I assumed the vast majority of restaurant menus are pretty similar, but I uh, I wanted to validate those assumptions before I started putting pixels down on my screen. Just you know like do like a little bit of initial research. So I looked up the menus for over a dozen restaurants I like, uh, and I jotted down what kind of information they included. So I saw that menus were divided up into different categories, uh, like you know appetizers, entrees, desserts, um, some of which had descriptions. Um, every menu included at least like a title and a price for each individual dish. Pretty straightforward. Many also included descriptions for items. So like what would tell you like what's in the food. And so and then there were like a scattering of other features. So some menus included photos, um, some like how spicy a dish was, 
Others marked whether a dish was vegetarian or gluten-free. Um, you know, some melt menus even allowed for filtering either by category or by diet. That one seemed super advanced. <laughs> Uh, yeah, potentially a lot of features. So let's just kind of like pare down all those things back into what we can make for like a minimum viable block. Menus should be divided up into sections, uh, each section with a heading. And each menu item should contain a title, price, and optional description. That's it. That's all we really need for a restaurant menu. Um, thinking on it further, I was like, okay, each section could be a parent block that includes a heading. Uh, with menu items as children. Uh, and, you know, why a, a block per section rather than like the whole block being one menu? Um, I figured by breaking the blocks, uh, breaking like the, the whole restaurant menu down into sections, you could uh, make it easier to rearrange your menu, um, style different sections differently, uh, and just scale your menu uh, much larger. So a few additional options would make the, the block um, much more useful for a lot of restaurants. Uh, so, if we have a parent block, that means we could have children block, uh, children blocks, child blocks, whatever. And so, the ability to intersperse uh, additional headings, paragraphs, and images into a menu would really make it a lot more useful. So that would that would cover a lot of the different miscellaneous use cases I saw, uh, like section descriptions and the occasional image highlighting a specific dish. So you should be able to add these then to your menu uh, into your block. Uh, I also thought it would be helpful to include a dietary notes or allergen warning toggle. So like you turn it on for a specific dish and then you could add, you know, say it's gluten free, it's vegan, uh, say how spicy it is, additional notes. Um, and I really wanted to like emphasize that it's a thing that you should add to your menus, which is why it's a setting um, rather than like just relying on people to add it to their description. So column support. Uh, many of the menus I saw broke up sections uh, into multiple columns just to better use up space on the page. So you'd have like half the items on one side, half the items on the other. And since Gutenberg has column support, it just made sense to include it. And then additional block styles. So I thought that the default style uh, could show the title and description on the left and the price on the right. But we could also add another style that's just title, description, and price centered on the page. Uh, it was a popular style amongst the restaurant menus I researched, so it, it figured that we should, you know, we should support both of those. So that's the scope. Now that we've kind of figured out what we want, let's figure out where each piece of the, the block should live. The setup state should include placeholder text for most important the most important content on the menu. So that's, you know, your section heading and one empty menu item that includes a, pr a name, price, and description. So this establishes all your baseline patterns and starts teaching people how to use your block straight off the bat. Um, so for convenience, uh, the block should default to adding a new menu item. Um, so all people need to do to get another item is to press enter at the end of the description field. So you can uh, still press like down to get outside the, the parent block, but you shouldn't have to like constantly be toggling open the library if you wanna add another block. Because we have a parent block and a child block, each will have its own toolbar. Um, Latest, I think like two releases ago in Gutenberg, um, the ability to like click into, like double click into Paraplox got added and it's like a much smoother experience now. Um, so like the fact that it is like two blocks is actually much, much less of a hassle. So looking through our scope, uh, the only setting that seems to belong inside the parent toolbar, um, the restaurant menu, the like the parent block is our alternate menu style. So uh, whether you want horizontal or vertical. Um, and I thought about adding support for wide and full width layouts to the block, um, but the majority of menus I saw were actually constrained to the content width. So that's one of those things where like maybe start without it. And then if you find that a bunch of, you're getting a bunch of feature requests, um, then you can add it later. But if you add it now, you'll have to support it forever. So worth, um, worth kind of like testing out and, and seeing what people actually want. So our child block is menu items, uh, consists of our title, price, and description. These fields could benefit from like some super basic text formatting, bold and italic, seemed reasonable. I decided to include those. Uh, strike through and link, which are available in the paragraph block, felt kind of unnecessary in this context. So I excluded them and I only, I only had uh, bold and italic. You know, but once again, if 
it turns out people really want these things, you could always add it in a future release. So what's left to include in our block? Uh, there's only two settings that we haven't talked about yet. Um, columns and our allergen toggle. So I found plenty of menus that use a one column layout in my research, but just as many that use you know two or more columns. Uh, it seemed like setting, uh, like actually having columns was worth supporting uh, and Gutenberg comes with column support available. But you know, thinking about it, you know, you probably don't want people to add infinite columns to the menu block. Like you're not going to be able to fit more than like maybe like four columns on most layouts. So um, I would just limit the number of columns to that. So you so you don't end up with like like sixteen columns that have like three letters in them each. It's just like a smart constraint, smart default. So let's talk about this like dietary notes allergen toggle. Um, so turning it on would add a new field underneath the item description. Uh, so you can add some extra details like gluten-free or vegan, uh, including a description within the sidebar, uh, like so provide a new dietary advice, it's a, you know, whatever. It just makes it clearer that what that setting does, especially if uh, it has a more ambiguous label, like dietary notes, oh, what is that? Oh, I read this description, now I know what that is. Because not every menu item is going to need one, it's just a setting you turn on for individual menu items that needed it. And honestly, like you probably even could just could put it on by default um, if you if you like really wanted to keep it simple. So let's not forget about the block icon. Uh, the block needs two: one for the parent block, restaurant menu, and then one for the custom child block, menu item. Uh, so I looked through some icon libraries looking for inspiration um, and, you know, I found a clipboard that made me think of like restaurant, some menus I've seen like in a restaurant, they'll like hand you the menu on a clipboard. Uh, so I use that as my parent block. And then I found this pizza icon to use as uh, the actual like menu item because it illustrates food. And of course, um, use existing Gutenberg components when you're uh, adding stuff to your sidebar. So like, don't just, don't just like roll your own settings, use the components that Gutenberg provides. Whether that's like buttons or groups or like ranges, just, just different thing. Like try to, try to stick to core patterns as much as you're able to. And if you do find a, like a need for a core pattern that doesn't exist yet, you can always make an issue on GitHub and suggest it. Um, you know, community feedback is the best way to evolve Gutenberg. So, you know, tell the team what you're doing. So let's put it all together. So you select your restaurant menu, you get that heading by default, uh, you can add it, whatever, add your menu item, add that toggle on or off, add a new menu item, just like fill it out, whatever. And then if you wanted, you could add another section and even control how many columns that section has. All right, so now that we've designed the block, all you need to do is uh, build it and code it. You know, super easy task to do. Uh, yeah, so hopefully you um, learned a little bit more about actually building the blocks uh, at previous sessions today. Um, but there's really good documentation. Uh, if you want to get started, there are some like starter kits out there. Um, can't really advise on actually building the block because I am not a developer, but there are a lot of resources for you to do that. So we're just going to move on and pretend that you've magically already built your block, that you're like very talented, much more talented than I am and go on to, uh, what you should do before actually launching your block, which, uh, I think you should consider doing some usability testing. So if you're part of a big team, like if you work at an agency or you work at like a product company um, with a lot of resources and like money to spend on research and testing, you could pay someone to recruit and run usability tests for you. Uh, or, you know, maybe you have a team of uh, UX experts. Awesome. That's great. Uh, but most people probably aren't going to have that. So if you're like a lone plugin developer or a theme developer, you're testing, you know, it doesn't have to like, you don't have to pay someone a bunch of money to do it for you. It doesn't have to be really comprehensive. You can just keep it small and really simple because when it comes down to it, all you want is some feedback. You want to make sure that like people understand how to use your block. They understand what it's for and they don't like tear out the hair and scream and run away. 
So there are better guides uh, out there for telling you how to conduct usability testing uh, than I can in our remaining time. So just this book, Rocket Surgery Made Easy by Steve Krug. Uh, super short, I love it. Uh, you can actually read a sample chapter online too if you're not quite sure if you wanna invest in the time and the money for reading the book. Or you know, if you want something condensed, this a list apart article, uh, Usability Testing Demystified, for all that it's like a decade old, is still a really great introduction into usability testing. Like there's there's tons of free resources out there just to learn. And then I would recommend running at least three tests, um, especially if you don't have a lot of resources. Keep it keep it simple. Um, if you if you do have more of a budget or, um, or you like more resources, you know maybe run five. Nothing's better than testing with live people. Um, I actually found that WordCamps are a great place to connect with potential customers and have them run through your block. Uh, we've been doing Gutenberg usability testing at WordCamps. Uh, we did it at US last year. We did it at Europe this year. Um, we're probably going to do it again at US this year. And it's just like like a great way to like actually like get feedback in real time. Uh, if that's not feasible, you can run tests through video chat and screen share. I've done this before. So like, like pop on a Zoom and then screen share and like record. Um, and like if if you're just like totally like I have no idea what I'm doing, but I have a little money put towards this, you can use an auto unmoderated online testing service. So like uh, usertesting.com or userinterviews.com or whatever. So any and when it comes down to it, any information is better than nothing, especially if you're working with limited resources. And then once you've run at least three tests, uh, sit down and just kind of sit through your recordings or your notes. Just find the biggest pain points on your block. So it's like is we couldn't figure out. Um, try changing those and then retesting. Just find the biggest pain points and iterate on them. You know, try to see if there's any like established patterns from other blocks that accomplish um, like what you're trying to do in like a more straightforward way. Uh, if you have time and budget, test again um, with some new volunteers just to see if like you've improved anything. Uh, if not, launch it. <laughs> You know, worst comes to worst, if you're super stressed about designing a block, use existing blocks as inspiration. So as, as David Bowie said, the only art I'll ever study is stuff I can steal from. You know, nothing is really original. Everything uh, at least has roots to what came before it. Just, uh, you know, one caveat, you don't be a jerk and rip somebody off, you know. Awesome. And you can, you can iterate ad nauseum, but like at some point you just, you really got to get stuff. Um, once you ship it, you'll probably start hearing some feedback. Um, you know, whether that's like feature requests or like bug reports from your customers. Um, and then you could use this direct feedback that you get from them in the future to make improvements. And thank you. Good luck. Happy block building. So sorry for all the technical issues. I'm glad that it's at least the end of the day. Um, I'm going to turn my slides off, but you can get me at Mail Choice like every everywhere on the internet on Twitter and let's see if we have any questions. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mel. We apologize for the technical. All right. Yes. Yeah, so uh, are all the theme question? developers mandated to include blocks and themes on WordPress.org now? No, you actually it's recommended that you don't include blocks in your themes. Uh, but instead, um, I would recommend adding custom styles so the blocks fit. I think that you should style core blocks. Uh, and that if you do want to actually add custom blocks to your themes, you should release them as a plugin and then just recommend them to people who install your theme. Uh, that way you you keep it separated. So if like anyone ever wants to change themes later, they don't have to worry about you um, like like losing any of that block, any of the blocks that you would have included. So it's it's like plugins and themes now. You want plugins to be separate um, just so like when you do change themes, you don't lose anything. So with the, a little bit about what I'm doing with the block directory. Um, so we started off with the idea that um, you shouldn't ever hit a dead end when you're working with blocks. So if you search for something in your block library and it's like, oh, you don't have that block, you know, what do you do then? You, you're stuck, you got nothing. So we wanna make sure that you always have a next step. So in this case, the, like the first kind of part of this project was um, to show you results from a directory of blocks when you start searching um, and like you have nothing installed. So uh, showing you like maybe like the top three results from the block directory and then um, letting you preview them in context uh, so you can actually like demo live. Um, yeah, so like that was the focus that we started with it was just like the ins that installation directly from the editor. And then um, what I've shifted to now 
is the um, the full block directory. So um, what it actually looks like in WP Admin. So like the you know you have the themes in the plugin section in WP Admin, adding a block section as well. So a place to manage all of the core blocks, a place to add new blocks, um, preview blocks. Uh, look at your reusable blocks because Gutenberg has like a reusable blocks, but like right now that screen kind of like lives in the ether. There's no, like it doesn't, it's not attached to any section. So like giving that a home. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I'm still going. But yeah, like, I mean, the goal is just to have like a first class library for blocks in the way that we have the same thing for themes and plugins. Thank you very much, Mel. It was wonderful to host you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And see you in the closing remarks uh, track. I've also put a link here for us all. So thank you.